Okay, well good morning everybody. Welcome to the uh, tax layer class on the ITIN, Individual Taxpayer Identification Number. And before we get started or into the slides, I'd just like to get a show of hands. Uh, does everybody here provide that service to their clients or you're looking at adding it? Does there, everybody provide the ITIN service to them? Some folks are new, if you raise your hands, if you're not doing it and you're just <laughs> trying to find out a little bit about what it's about. So let me ask you, um, or let me just kind of tell you, the folks that do, because we're all here to network, right? We're all here to learn from each other. It's not a, these are my secrets, I'm not gonna share them with anybody. We're all here to share what makes us successful with other preparers. So again, those people that do the items, raise your hands. These are resources for you. Okay, so if you have questions that I can't answer or Dante can't answer, go to the people that are actually in the storefront that are dealing with that live situation. Okay, so if y'all don't mind being a resource, a mentor, or at least a little bit of assistance to these folks that are getting into that venture, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, real quick, we're gonna go over this and then for the benefit of you folks that are just getting started, I'll do a return in the software Y'all are familiar with the software. Is everybody familiar with the tax program? Okay, so I'll do a return in the software utilizing an ITIN on a primary taxpayer, just so that you kind of get the feel of how it works. Okay, sound good? All right, so let's get started. What is an individual taxpayer identification number? Again, we call it the ITIN. An ITIN, and a lot of this we're getting straight from the IRS, and we'll have references to those links, so you can take those down. ITIN is a tax processing number, okay, issued by the IRS to certain resident and non-resident aliens, their spouses or their kids, okay. It is available to persons required to have a taxpayer identification number for tax purposes, but who do not have and are not eligible to obtain a Social Security. So what you have is the division between Social Security and the IRS. In other words, the IRS doesn't care what your status is, if you owe us money, we want it, okay? So since you couldn't qualify to get a social, we're gonna give you a different number that applies to us directly so that we can record your payments, okay? And charge you accordingly or give you rebate, uh, uh, refunds. How to apply for an ITIN at the end of the presentation. We'll do this more in the uh, uh, presentation of the software, how easy it is to do it, but you'll, we'll go through the 1040 and the W7, okay? Where to apply? There's three, three options. Mail the form, W-7 application, original ID, so it's on a leap of faith that the Postal Service doesn't lose it, okay? How many of y'all have had documents that are lost? How hard is it to recover? Very, hard. very, very, very. So you may have recommendations. Um, obviously, you're sending it certified, registered, whatever, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, that only registers the package, not the contents, okay? So once they open it, whatever happens, happens. All right, original documents or certified copies to the address listed on the form instructions. Utilize an acceptance agent, I asked that earlier. How many of you all are acceptance agents? Acceptance agents are those of you that have applied and been uh, designated as an acceptance agent and that is, I, I, I liken it to a notary public, you know? They trust you that what you're doing is right. So it helps to become, and I would recommend to y'all, become an acceptance agent with the IRS. What yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, the re actual requirements, I don't know. It used to be back in the day, you had to do so many minimum, and then they think you had like a questionnaire or something. They, they just wanna make sure that what you're doing, well, what comes out of your office, You've got a check mark from the IRS saying, you know what, we trust them. They're an acceptance agent. Just again, like a notary public. You're trusted with a seal, okay. acceptance agent. You've been doing this, this forever, and we like what you do. We trust you. So you, we know that your submissions of applications are going to be good. Okay. okay. So please late? look that up. Yes? Is it too late to apply? No, it's never too late to apply. There's no deadline for an acceptance agent. Oh. So, you know, starting tomorrow or Monday, look at becoming an acceptance agent. Okay. okay. 
we call them certified, I just call them skeptic acceptance agents, will certify all the ID documents for the primary and, and secondary as well as passports and birth certificates. So you're almost taking a step out of what the IRS would have to do. Or go to the local IRS office that has the Taxpayer Assistance Center, okay? Again, strong recommendation, become an acceptance agent. I'm not sure on what the requirements are. Like I said, back in the day, you had to do X amount of applications before they would even consider you. I looked online, there's a couple of um, organizations that will certify you. You can do a PowerPoint, it's a long PowerPoint presentation, and you fill out some form, and that's it. Okay, well then if there's no minimum, then that's, that's good to know. That's good to know, thank you. All right, completing the uh, W-7, the reason for applying. Once you establish that your client needs the I-10, you begin the process of completing W-7. Determine the tax status. Non-resident alien for non-IRS purposes, they may be a resident alien for tax purposes. So there you have the conflict. Social Security may say you're a non-resident alien, whereas the IRS says, hey, we treat you as a resident alien because you're here, because you work, because you owe taxes, okay? So big conflict there. These publications, again, this is where we say we're just referencing this, and all this is in your My Account, okay? The following pubs are available online at irs.gov. That's where everything starts, irs.gov, okay? Pub 9, 519, pub 901. There's a phone number, good luck, okay? Because that's the generic 829-1040 that the whole country calls, okay? And then they break it down from there. All right, if you're outside the U.S., you might have better luck, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, select the category of which your client falls. Now, we're going to go through this when I do the tax return. We're actually going to complete the W-7, okay? So reason for applying, okay? Check in the box. There's various uh, reasons, and we'll choose one that I think is the most common. If you choose box A or F, you must provide tax treaty information, okay? Most of those won't be A or F, okay? Box H other, kind of drilling down. If the reason your client's ITIN request is not described in boxes A through G, then you go to H as other and put detail as to what their purpose is for applying. Again, that'll be rare because the first seven should probably take care of it. <coughs> At the end of the presentation, be able to complete the W-7 applying one through six. If I'm going too fast, let me know. But there's just, you know, it's just, it's not that difficult. Now we'll do a breakdown of the lines. Pretty self-explanatory. And your client's first name, middle initial, and last name. Now remember, the two surnames, right? Garcia Sanchez, Sanchez Garcia, De Maria, whatever. So you have to determine, uh, based on prior tax returns, what you consider or what they've normally filed as middle name and last name. Usually. There's not a big middle name, it's a long last name, okay? Some cultures, and you may even have a hyphen or apostrophe. Enter the way the name appears on the documents to prove foreign status and identity, all right? <coughs> name at birth if different. So if it's changed since their birth name, you'll put it on the line name at birth if different, that's 1B. Class name changed due to a marriage or uh, just a legal cert, uh, change. Surname is now the same as their surname at birth. You do not need to complete this. So what they're saying is the client's names change, but maybe they got divorced, so they're back to what they were originally, then there's no need to complete it. Okay, so, so what their name is now versus what it was there, doesn't matter what was in between, okay? Mailing address, mailing address, only if it's different than the address you're entering on line three, okay? So it's kind of the, harsh, the cart before the horse. So you gotta know what line three is gonna be before you put it on line two, okay? And that's where they'll send all the uh, paperwork back to them. And don't use a PO box or care of, okay? Uh, do any of y'all have issues with mailing address where they don't have a mailing address and you wanna use yours or, or is there any situations like that? So everybody has a valid mailing address. Okay, I know apartment dwellers, you move from one to another and hopefully the mail follows you 
because you don't know the time that the application is going to take. So if their lease is almost up, kind of warn them if they have an address that they want to use that they know they'll be at in a couple of weeks, that might be a good suggestion. Foreign address, okay? If they're permanent, non-US address. If your client no longer has one, okay, then only the name on number three would be where they came from. So they're no, they don't have, no longer have an address out of country, then they would be basically where they arrived from. Again, no P.O. box. Birth information, 224, okay, 0101, 19, whatever. Country of birth, country where the applicant was born, country recognized by the U.S., okay, Department of State. So it can't be some made-up country. City, state, or province of birth, okay? It's optional, but recommended. So if it's not required, but it helps the application process, by all means, please include it. And they usually know city, state, or province. The gender, for whatever reason, they want the gender. Country of citizenship, okay? So if they're still in Mexico, you put Mexico, not MX, not MEX you put Mexico, okay? Dual citizenship, separated by a slash. Foreign tax ID number, okay? They have a foreign tax ID number. Your client has a Canadian social security. I don't think that's gonna happen much down in this area, but enter that as well if they have it. Again, the more information you provide, the better it is to get that application processed quickly. What's the average time, by the way, that you've experienced an application being submitted and, and uh, returned? Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks? Okay, plus if they need more information. And we'll get into the things that'll <laughs> cause delays in a second, okay? But four to six weeks. We're up to line 6C the type of US visa, number, and expiration date, okay? B1, B2, the number and expiration date, okay? You would put it B1, the number, again, two, two, and four. If the visa's been issued under duration of stay, that's the abbreviation as the expiration date. So there you can actually use an abbreviation. That would cover for the date. Yes. With, with, the, with the tax um, They should have their, their documentation certified before they, they come in? No, they're going to bring originals for the most part or certified copies. So they're going to bring the paperwork to the preparer. The preparer is going to process that as, okay, we're gathering all the documents, we're completing the form, we're submitting all that to the IRS for processing to generate the IT number. Right, but they're still now, they made the change several years ago, they still have to submit the paperwork as well. In the past, the certified acceptance agents could just say, okay, I've already reviewed it, I've certified it, we're good to go. Then they changed and said, no, you still gotta send it as well, okay? okay? It kinda lost one of the true benefits of becoming a certified acceptance agent, but that's a very good question, thank you. All right, we're up to 6D. You should only enter, and these are IDs, the information for one of the documents to prove foreign status. So if they have multiples, just put one, the most, uh, and identity. If you're submitting more than one document, then you'll have to attach a separate sheet of paper, entering the second document in the same format. So if you've got one, it's sufficient, that's good. What are some typical forms of ID that y'all collect? Passports. Passports. Uh, certificate. Birth certificates. Birth certificates. But the passport is international, so it's Right. And that's the biggest scare, if it gets lost, okay? Again, we're back to the Postal Service and the IRS Processing Center. Has anybody lost a passport or had a client where their passport's been lost? I have a client that uh, they, just, they recently sent it to renew the new, renew the W-7. It's a new law. Right, the renewal. So they said, they said, it's been a month, 
they did not have the original right. Oh, okay. Yeah, it is scary. I do recommend sending certified to the uh, post office, and they get also a little card when they got the document. That's one of my biggest recommendations. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know because losing the documents is, is, is everybody's biggest nightmare. They are requesting the original. Okay. They actually are requesting uh, permanent uh, residence card. Uh huh. How do you want to send your residence card? Yeah, I mean, that, it's like giving your wallet. Exactly. And now, what do you do? Yes. Those are two of the most common. Consular. Yeah. In some big cities, they have the consulate. Uh, I know in Houston, you know, the, the, the Mexican consulate constantly busy with, with, with people or there. The voters registration for yeah. Mexico. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Also. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. That's good to know. Identification of the documents. Check the box for the type being submitted. If it's not already shown on this line. That would be a good question. Passport, driver's license, state ID, or from Customs and Immigration. I think all of these have a picture tied to the name, correct? So all of these have a picture tied to the name and other if it's not one of those, okay? I don't know what other would be if you don't have a birth certificate, but the birth certificate, there's no picture attached no, to it. If you send the voter's registration or the consular ID, you have to send the birth certificate. Okay. Yeah, shot shots. Records. Okay, so if it's a child, birth certificate and shot records. Yeah, Doctor. Uh, they can attach a photo on the shot records. Oh, okay, a shot record with a picture. Okay, that's good to know. Again, continuing with ID of documents, enter information relevant to it. The ID number, expiration date, 224. Client's entry date into the U.S. Now, a lot of times that's not exact, but you'd be as approximate, at least with the year. Okay, because does, does anybody really remember the month and the day that they came over? Yeah, well, you, you can, you can, you know, be creative with the estimate, but the year is going to be the, the, the important thing. <laughs> and the agency that issued the document, so whether it's the state or federal or Mexican consulate. Remind, a reminder, entry of date in the U.S., okay. Two categories of documentation. Supporting ID that proves the foreign status and their identity. And then you have supplemental documents that prove if an exception, exception is required that it's been met in lieu of filing the tax return, okay? Both acceptance agents and certifying acceptance agents must submit this a, a documentation with Form W-7. I think in the past it wasn't required, but now they need it as well from both of these, okay, acceptance agents and certified. Mm -hmm. well, again, making them back down to what, what non-acceptance agents have exactly. to do. There is a um, W instructions, and you can look at uh, online, and it tells you the list of documents that are acceptable. Okay. So this or this, this or this, you know, but it has to be one or two, or one of them uh, cover ID and, yes. Okay. So so different categories and options to that particular category and whether you need one or both or one may, one may replace both. So it's, it's uh, basically they're just trying to prove who they are, where they're from and that they've been here. Okay. Again, continuing on, the supporting IDs proves the identity and the foreign status like I just said. So the IRS accepts 13 documents shown in the appendix. Okay, so we'll show that in a sec. Valid unexpired passport, okay? And, and that's very important. It's got to be unexpired passport, okay? The only standalone. So if you've got the passport, that's your golden key, okay? And again, that's the biggest fear is that golden key is going to be lost, okay? So that pretty much supersedes just about anything else. That, I think, stand alone as, as a supporting document to provide. Must contain the date of entry stamp indicating entry into the U.S. Now, again, we're talking about legal entry into the U.S. for dependents from a country other than Canada or Mexico or dependents of military members. 
okay? If the passport does not contain a date of entry stamp, <coughs> then these are required in addition. Medical records, again, we talked about kids, shot records, I think you all said shot records. School records, okay, under 18. And if they're over 18, school records, rents, bank statements, utility bills, anything that proves an address, okay? Obviously an apartment, a bank statement proves what the account, utility bills proves the uh, residency, listing the applicant's name and address. So again, they're trying to validate the residency of where that person lives. If the passport's not required, submit at least two other documents. So if they don't uh, pro provide it, so if they don't have the passport, or choose not to submit it, then they have to substitute it with at least two of these documents. One with the photograph, exception for dependents or uh, <coughs> students under 18. The other one, documentation uh, for a dependent or student under 18 must include a civil birth certificate, okay? And again, if the passport's used, you don't have to worry about it. So do y'all recommend passports to your clients, even if there's that big risk? Okay, so you just, it's the easiest way to go. Residence uh, and data entry, right. Okay, and then it's just, let's pray and you hope know, that it comes back in six weeks. Right, hard to get, hard to find. This is a lot simpler. To, so again, the key here is the passport is going to be the best, the best method for applic applying. I made a copy of the passport. If, if, if it gets lost, just go to Rally and get another. Really? Okay. So that's pretty quick if it, to replace it? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. IDs, again, must be original or copies certified by the issuing agency. And, and where do you go for certified copies? Where do you all go? The consulate? I don't certify copies. So when you make copies, you just make copies or you? Uh, it's just for the file. Oh, OK. Last time I go, they, they accept like a notary copy yeah. certified. Uh -huh. They don't accept it anymore. I think it's so a notary copy is not, not considered? Uh, no. Really? Really? Wow. Okay. Okay, but the consulate is, is good to go. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a couple of years old now, but as of June of 2012, no longer accepts copies notarized, just like you said, okay. By the U.S. public notary or certain foreign notary publics authorized to certify documents under the Hague Convention. So you're exactly right. The fraud has probably kicked that out. So now they want you to go to an established uh, uh, <coughs> the consulate. Acceptance agents, review supporting ID, proving the foreign status, and attach it to. So in the past, you didn't have this part, okay? Everybody wanted to be an acceptance agent because all you had to do was almost like, again, like a notary said, I've reviewed it, it's good, boom, let's send it off. And everybody loved that because there was no risk of losing the original documentation. And then the IRS changed that and said, no, you guys, you got to go back to the same. And I think a lot of it had to do with, unfortunately, fraud. Okay. So now they want it from everybody. So the benefit of the acceptance agent was declined a little bit because of that. Certifying acceptance agents review and validate the documentation and describe them in a certificate of accuracy. So now they can pretty much validate what they're doing and create what's called certificate of accuracy. Copies of the documents for the primary and secondary must be sent to the IRS with this certificate of accuracy. For dependents, attach the original or certified copies, okay? So you still have to send copies of them. You don't have to send the originals, okay? So that might be a good thing because you're saying we've looked at the originals, they look good, we're going to submit a copy, okay? Supplemental documentation proves the exception. Again, this was if they didn't have any of the uh, upper ones. Met by taking the place of attaching the tax return to the W-7 and demonstrating that your client meets the criteria for claiming an exception. In other words, they qualify 
for one of these exceptions as to why they're not submitting a tax return, okay? All of the supplemental documents must be attached to the W-7, okay? So if they're not doing that, everything that is attached to it must be submitted. And I'm assuming originals. Reminder, the supplemental documentation must be attached by both the acceptance agents and certifying acceptance agents. Supplemental docs must not be described in the COA, certificate of agency that these folks do, except for partnership agreement information. Okay, now that you're rarely gonna run into, okay? But it's a reminder nonetheless. A COA is completed and signed by you if you're a certifying acceptance agent. So you're putting your name on the line as validating what you've seen, what you've, what you've uh, uh, taken in from the applicant. It is attached to the W-7 and declares that the agent reviewed the docs proving their identity and foreign status. So the certifying acceptance agent is probably what they created after what we used to call the acceptance agent, okay? So this is the one that does seem to have almost like the, the notary public stamp of approval and you're still gonna attach it. So your name's on the line here, okay? So be sure that you're not, you're, you're, you're on the up and up, you're not letting anybody slide because they're a good friend or whatever. You are putting your name on the line. I'm sure there's severe harsh penalties if they find out something now, okay? The original, exactly, exactly. So you treat that as if your business is on the line when you do that. And, and again, strongly recommend you folks look at becoming one of these, especially if you do a lot. Okay, it'll simplify the process. Only the authorized representative may sign. So not your staff or anybody that works in your office, you alone, the person that is the certified acceptance agent is the only person that can sign that, that doc, okay? After you complete that copy, the acceptance agent must attach a copy of the document for the primary and secondary. Uh, it's kind of redundant. To the, and, and the original documents for the dependent form, okay? Copy of the document for the primary and secondary and the original documents if for the dependents, okay? Sample form, certified acceptance, this number, form 14194 in pub 4520. Available form, the IRS will use only by acceptance agents. Have you previously received a U.S. temporary number or employer number, EIN? Okay, question, it's a yes or no. Temporary ID number that would have been issued to an individual who had previously made a payment or filed a tax return without an SSN or ITIN. To be honest with you, I don't know how you'd be able to do that and be accredited or registered or recognized to actually do a return without one of these two, but apparently it happens. So they wanna know, have you done that? And the employer ID number is issued to you by the IRS, so if you were self-employed, an employer ID number, okay? That's gonna be rare. Check the appropriate box. If yes, you know the I-10, of course, and you put that number in that you used in the past, or if you do, if no, or if you don't remember it, check no and go to 6F. This is drilling down to rare exceptions. This is not gonna be what the majority of people would, would complete as yes. Name of a college, university, or the company, okay? If X, if F is checked. Also enter the city and state and the length of stay. So if they're here for these reasons, to attend a college, university, or working, they wanna know that that's yes, and the city and state that they are at this college, university, or the company they're working in. Exceptions, again, probably rare. Identify and apply exceptions to the tax return filing requirement that may be applicable. Why are you not attaching a tax return? Enter required information for box H. What are the exceptions to the requirement, okay, to attach a US income tax return? In other words, why am I not attaching that tax return? Gonna be rare. Although most applicants must attach a tax return to their W-7, there are limited circumstances under which an ITIN will be issued without a tax return. Okay, have you all encountered that yourselves? Any, any, any person that filed it without a tax return? Okay, so again, it's very, very rare. 
but they want to make note of it. When they don't have uh, W7, it has to be the first time when they pay on their taxes. It goes together, the tax. Right, right, right. So most, all of yours attach W-7 with the tax return. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So this really is, is going to be very, very rare. So if any of the five exceptions, which are listed in the exceptions section of the appendix, apply to your client, you'll not need to attach the tax return. Okay? If you claim one of these exceptions, okay, you must submit proof of your claim in lieu of the tax return. That's pretty self-explanatory. For more information about exemptions and to view examples, IRS.gov, Pub 1915. Again, very rare will you'll have that. And it's also in a Spanish format, 35265T. Apply the signature requirements to the W-7. Who signs the W-7 if the applicant is a dependent under 18 years of age? Okay. The applicant, <coughs> the parent, or a court-appointed guardian. Copy of the uh, paper showing legal guardianship must be attached. Do you all have that a lot in your place where the kids don't have a parent? Um, where they need a, okay, it's usually the, 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 the right, they apply on behalf of the children. Okay, good, good, good. But you all don't see this one much. Court appointed guardian, okay. If an adult, other than a parent or a court appointed guardian, signs the form, they must have a power of attorney. And again, it doesn't sound like you all encounter this much because you do have a parent, okay. So someone other, power of attorney, and then this 2848 authorizes them to sign it. They are saying it's now available in Spanish. The individual applicant, if other than oh, the individual, this individual, other than the applicant, should sign their name in the space provided and check the appropriate box that indicates their relationship to the applicant. So it's probably going to be some type of other. It's not the parent, it's not the court appointed guardian. What if they're 18 years of age and older who signs the W 7? The applicant themselves or any other individual? Again, parent court-appointed guardian, a CPA, etc., whom the applicant grants power of attorney to, okay? And in this case, you'll have to attach that. Or someone other than the applicant should sign their name in the space provided and check the appropriate box in the case their relationship. The only reason I could think of that is, is if that person is, uh, uh, I hate to, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, mentally challenged or, or, or they have uh, some type of handicap they can't sign and the parent signs on their behalf. The application date must be dated when signed and submitted by the acceptance agent or certified acceptance agents within five business days. So you all have a timeline of when you get that and, and send it out as quickly as possible. Okay. Phone number. IRS may use this phone number to resolve the application any discrepancies. So I don't know if you all can use your phone number or the applicant's phone number. How do you all treat that? You put the applicant's number. Uh -huh. Okay, so your phone number will be at the bottom of the form anyway? Yeah, okay. Why not? All right, because they're going to come to you anyway. Yeah. So, and that's good. They trust you. They trust you. All ITINs not used at least once on the income tax return for years 14, 15, 16 will expire this year. Okay, so we know that if they've not been used at least once, they're going to expire. They're just going <coughs> to, it's like your EFIN. If you don't use your EFIN in two years, it's inactivated. Okay. And you have to start over, which I, I believe means you'd have to reapply from scratch to, re, to get another number. And I don't know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a good question of if you do let it expire and you reapply, do you get the same number back or do you get a different number altogether? It should be the same number. The same number, they just reactivate it? Seven, six, yeah. Renew. renew by a certain time. Not this case, you don't have to worry about it. But they also say if there is a part of the IRS website and it says 
if uh, your dump system was issued before 2012, you have to renew it. But they don't say that to the people. So. Oh, right. Do they send them a letter? Do they? They send them a letter, but they don't specify. They also, if I got it, my W7, whatever, my 18, mm -hmm. if I have it before 2012, 12. I have to. Renew. Regardless of whether you used it or not on your tax returns, it's still up for renewal. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So what she's saying is, the IRS is saying is prior to 2012, whether you used your ITIN on a tax filing or not, it's still due for renewal. Whereas here, it's just if you haven't used it, from 14, 15, 16, then it's gonna be expired, considered expired, considered a, a, a non-working number. And they may think, I think the assumption is, and, 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 and I'm just going on a limb here, that they may think you're no longer in the country because you haven't filed a tax return in so long. Okay, so they're just cleaning out the system. Here we go. ITINs with these digits, 70, one, two, or 80, will expire regardless regardless okay if it will be included on next year's tax return so what you all should be doing is definitely contacting anybody that you've done a tax return with those digits and say look if you plan on coming back we got to get you to renew your i-10 before the end of the year or else all kinds of heck is going to break out can you imagine the backlog the backlog that will happen in january if people haven't done this and how it's going to delay their their return f uh, fun uh, funding Individuals with these numbers should have received a CP48 notice from the IRS. Now, again, if it goes to that address and they've moved three times since, you know, does it follow them? Because they're going on the address maybe of the last tax return that they filed, and that tax return may have been two years ago. Okay, so again, y'all's assistance in contacting them and reaching them and making them aware of that would be greatly uh, uh, helpful in getting them to resolve that issue. Okay. Everybody's going to have someone who said, I didn't do it. Now what? And we're in January. So now what do you do? So do as much on a proactive side to notify these folks as possible. With 78 or 79, they have expired and may be renewed at any time. Personally, I don't know the difference between these middle digits. Does anybody know what those digits mean? What categories they're in? I think those are the first uh, items that they give. Okay. So the answer was it could be based on a time frame of when they were first issued, 78 or 79, and they've since gone to the 70, 71, 72, 78, 70, or 80. Now, individuals with these middle digits have the option to renew items for their entire family at the same time. So if it's multiples within the household, they can do all of them at the same time instead of individually. Family members include the taxpayer, spouse, and any dependents claimed on that tax return. Okay, uh, But a, a good question as to how they categorize these in, in, in year of issue or some other algorithm. Unfortunately, I will tell you, I personally don't know a way in our software to filter the middle two digits. So uh, you can run, you can run uh, uh, ascending and descending by the first number, but not by the middle digits. So you may have to go through your, your client list and, and look who has those numbers. And, Regardless. Yes, before the 2012, regardless of that. Okay. All right, so now <clears throat> tax returns and submitted in, in 2018 with an ex expired item will be processed. However, so if they didn't do the renewal like they should have, they come in, they file the tax return, the exemptions or certain tax credits will be disallowed. So they're going to be very surprised that that refund amount has been shrunk quite a bit because of those credits. All right. Now, you file an amended or if once that, no, oh, that's a good point. Once the item is submitted and processed, any applicable exemptions and credits will be restored. So what I'm thinking that's saying is you don't have to do an amended return. It's going to be on the IRS's part to say, okay, we've qualified you. 
you're entitled to these rebates and credits, I mean to these, uh, to these exemptions and credits, here's the money, okay? So it does obviously behoove them to get this done as quickly as possible. By not doing it after the December, uh, before January 1st, it doesn't prevent them, it just temporarily removes it until they correct it themselves through y'all. So you may still be doing a bunch of uh, W-7s yeah. applications in January and February. So how's that going to work? If Apparently they're going to be put on a hold. That they'll still they'll still accept the the return. It's still going to be acknowledged, but when the funding comes through, they're going to get those credits disallowed and those exemptions disallowed. Now, whether they get a letter or something from that, I'm not sure, but they're going to be surprised that that's not done. And so it should instruct them. The reason we did not allow those credits and exemptions was because you did not renew in time. Simply renew the application, and then that money will be forwarded. Top errors, okay? So let's look at what are some of the uh, most common errors. The forms are incorrectly prepared, incomplete, or when information is missing. I'm sure you folks never have that issue. You do everything complete, everything you take your time, and do everything right. Sometimes they're within your control, sometimes they're out of your control, okay? Your client's application is suspended or rejected, causing a delay. So if you don't take your time, it's not prepared incorrectly, it's not complete, something's missing or something was answered wrong, okay, then that's gonna cause a delay. Shown are a couple of descriptions of the most common errors, okay? Again, this is very simple. If you take your time, you'll avoid 90% of it. You just check the right box from A to H. What was the reason? Check the right box. You did not attach the supporting IDs to prove the identity and status, okay? Again, acceptance of the children, at least one of the documents have a photograph. So make sure that there's a photograph attached to prove who they are. And it doesn't mean a selfie, it means a government issue, okay? The acceptance agents will submit the COA with copies of the documentation. You did not attach the tax return, okay, to show the purpose for obtaining it, and you must attach it unless your client claims one of the exemptions that we talked about before. You did attach supporting identification, but it's not on the list of the 13 accepted forms, okay? So you submitted something other than what was uh, required. You submitted a W-7 for a dependent, not shown on the client's tax return. In other words, you attach the tax return, but that applicant is not on that tax return, okay? Or you did not a submit a, sub a W-7, the opposite for a client that's on the tax return, applicant that's on the tax return. You submitted the W-7 for a dependent who is not a citizen or resident alien and does not reside in Mexico or Canada, so from another country. You did not enter or complete the client's foreign address on line three, okay? So just make sure that you complete the required questions and you'll avoid a lot of this uh, missing information. You did not enter all of your client's birth information. Again, it's incomplete. You did not complete to identify the supporting documentation or the date your client entered the United States. And again, we talked about if you don't know the exact month and date, but you know the year, go with that and just you know be as, as uh, uh, an estimated guess on the month and the date. The year is the most important thing. Your client didn't sign their name. Okay, as it appears. So they signed it different than what it looks like on the other information. So if another signature appears on the that other than the applicant, you will need to attach the power of attorney, okay, and what their relationship is. In most cases, unless it's a child, the applicant's going to sign with no problem. The ITIN process, you're unsure about your client's eligibility for an SSN, refer to Social Security, SSA.gov. I would say, talk to your network of preparers. Hey, have you had this situation? How did y'all treat it? Okay, that's a lot easier. Individual who's eligible for an SSN is not eligible. It's one or the other. They have an SSN or they have an ITIN. The goal is to eventually turn this into a working social. So if you can get them to become a uh, citizen, that's great. 
And I'm sure a lot of y'all do that too, to try and get them to become citizens. Renewing the I-10, things you need, okay? Some of these numbers are gonna expire, again, based on those middle numbers. I-10 to those who are filing or reporting requirement but don't have and are not eligible to get a social security. Rehashing what we talked about before. If you need to renew, you should, sum should sum submit a complete application this fall, like right now, to avoid any delays. Here's some information. Uh, IRS works to help taxpayers affected by ITIN changes. Renewals begin in October last month. That form there, IR 2016-100. IRS now accepting ITIN renewal applications. Taxpayers encouraged to act soon. Avoid delays, that should be in 2018. And that's IR 2016-129. Frequently asked questions, okay, things you'll need. And they have that link at the bottom go.usa.gov slash xkz2p. Okay, now I'm gonna show y'all real quick. We've got a little bit of time. How much time do we have? I'm sorry? We have till 10? Oh, okay. For the benefit of you folks, on utilizing the tax program. This is the 2016. Oh. Dante. Dante. Now my lovely assistant will get the program on the screen. I don't know. I was trying to get the program on there. The program's on. Let me see. I'm in the Does it show anything? That's on though. Yeah. When I close the slide, yeah, when I close the slide, huh? when I close the slide, the, it, should have, it, should have, it should have taken the... Yeah, it should have. The C over there, because it's not, it's not showing anything on the screen. See? All right. Now you see it, right? Yeah. No signal. Oh, okay, great. Okay, great. All right, you all can see it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a return. And as you all know, or, or let me just update you, when you create an I-10, you don't start with the fake social that they've been using. You simply key in zeros all the way across the board. Okay? So key in zeros, nine zeros. It'll take the next sequential count and assign it that next number. So I've done one before. So now it's saying this is number two. Okay, so number two and it'll just continue every time you do one. Do you want to create a new return? We'll say yes. And we'll do, uh, let's do a married filing joint. And we'll do, I'm a item. And you'll notice it didn't ask for the validation on the social because it's already plugged that, dub, that, that number in there, that sequential count.
Now I'm going to put a valid social on the spouse, okay? Put some phone numbers. Everything looks good. Again, no validation on the social because it's already plugged it in. Do you have dependents? We'll say yes. Create the first one. Give them a social. And that's the only one we'll do. All right? So we've got a family of three. Primary does not have a social, but the spouse and the child do. The affordable care, I'm just going to make it simple, okay? We're just going to say yes and outside the marketplace. Here's our summary. Now, if I was using the scanner, does anybody use the scanning features? Good. You go to scan. W-2, here we go. All right, so we're going to create the W-2 on the taxpayer. And what you'll notice is that it's prompting you for that social that they've been using or that they've been, you know, misusing, abusing, whatever social they've had. So we'll put that social in now. And then the ITIN, I mean the uh, employer, we'll just pick from the list. Put in some wages, some withholding. We'll just make it simple, make it 3,500, and keep everything the same, okay? That's the only one, no other income. All right, so now what you'll do is you go to over here, miscellaneous forms. And you'll go down to number 13, application for ITIN W7. Who are we creating? From the list, we're going to do I'm ITIN. And we can do apply for a new one or renew. So let's just do renew since most of yours are going to be renewals anyway. Okay. I usually say non resident alien filing a tax return not eligible for social. Does anybody use anything different? Okay, so that's number two is usually the most common reason that they're attaching it. Okay, so we're going here. And now here, if you look up here, remember when you have the magnifying glass up on the uh, toolbar, all it means is I can see a PDF of what I'm actually completing. Okay, does everybody use that tool? Okay, it's a, it's a quick reference to the actual form. It's just a PDF. It's not anything you can make entries on. Okay, so now you have at your disposal, you can view what basically the form looks like. So what we're going to do, you can see it's already input a bunch of the information. I'm going to close that out. We'll start answering. We'll start answering the questions. Renew an existing return. Reason for filing. Okay, it's already in there, but we had already answered it. Okay. The legal name, it carried it. Name at birth if different. Remember we talked about that. So if they had a different name at birth, we would put it there. Mailing address, they're in the US. Foreign address if different. Country, city, state of birth. Okay, so let's just say uh, Mexico. Let me spell that right. What's the state for Mexico City or province? Oh, okay. Is that right? Okay. We've got that there, male or female. I still don't know the reason for that, but it is a requirement. Foreign tax ID, if any, type of U.S. visa, if any. Do any of those have a visa in your applicants? So you leave that. 
Identification submitted, okay? So here we go, and we'll just say passport, okay? Issued by Mexico. Now this is where your entry date was. You take an estimate, I'll just say 0701. Uh, 2001. Everything's filled in. <coughs> Identification submitted. Previously received an ITIN. Remember we talked about that. Have they had one in the past? Name of college, company, university. Name of delegate if applicable. Acceptance agent. And we'll say on this one, no. But where you would set that up, by the way, if you are, is in your prepare profile. So when you're in your prepared profile, you can set up your acceptance agent information and it would carry to the uh, W-7. English or Spanish will stay with English. And so now we've finished it. So if we want to look at that form, we can quickly go here to view results, W-7. And now the completed form is there. Okay. And again, if you were the acceptance agent information, it would carry over to that. So it's really a nice feature to have. Let's go to the due diligence because we have to complete that. I'm sorry, I went to the wrong one. Payments and credits. Oh, that's right, that's right. So what you'll have here, and this is, this is nice here, under view results, when there's no EIC, I don't know if a lot of you use this, but when they don't get assigned the earned income credit, <coughs> the form will pop up as why no EIC was calculated. And they'll give you a list of, of disqualifiers, and it should have been a disqualifier here of the taxpayer social security number is not valid. So that should have been marked off. They, they, yeah, they mark it. Yes, but I will tell you this, and, and I always use this for people that have been using TaxWise, is when you print the return, that'll be blank. In TaxWise, I hate to pick on TaxWise, but I know this to be true, that valid invalid social would print out and people would always have the whiteout and take it out because they don't want anything, not even applied. They want it to be blank. So we've always left it blank when it's the primary, okay? So that's just a little comparison with a, a friendly competitor. Once you're done, of course I have to do, and just quick and dirty, we can get out of, oh, I'm sorry must answer the due diligence and this is on your end regardless of of, of the uh, the applicant status did you complete the return yes did you interview the taxpayer yes did you review adequate information now this is in regards to the tax return by the way yes did any information to be appear to be incorrect no did you satisfy the record retention yes especially if you're doing the scanning did you ask the taxpayer where he could provide documentation? Yes. Did you ask if any credits were disallowed or reduced in a prior year? No. Yes. Were any of these reduced or uh, disallowed? No. So we've qualified that. Credit eligibility. Did you certify that all answers are correct? Yes. Okay, so we're done here. Ready to mark the return complete? I'm going to say yes, kind of finishing it out, of course. My printer's not connected. Print to PDF. Does everybody have paper cut here? Is everybody in premium? Okay, so I've always requested that we change this. Are you ready to print to PDF to print to paper cut? It just makes more sense. I'll say yes, and then always, 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 one copy.
federal and state. And there you go. Now, if you don't have premium, this is a sweet tool to have in PaperCut. And I won't go off subject, but it'll be here now. And so now in PaperCut, you'll be able to list or see I'm an item. And if they have an email address, you can email it to them securely. Okay. Kind of rushed through it, but we got a little bit of time. Yes, sir. Uh, the people that's got an ATM, they got to pay the penalty for nominal insurance? For what? Oh, okay. The question is, do people at ITINs have to pay the penalty for no insurance? And my understanding is they would go under the exception of the uh, non-resident or not, not required to pay because they're not a, a legal citizen. So okay. that, that you definitely want to make sure because you, you, know, you don't want them paying a penalty that they could have an exception because they're not really a, a citizen of the country. So they weren't required under that guideline to purchase insurance. Okay. Folks, any other questions? I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was inf uh, informational. And uh, if you have any questions, please meet with some of these mentors. And uh, we, we got a few minutes. You can take some time and talk with them. Yes, sir, one more question. What about the people that live in Mexico? Do they still qualify for ITIN? If people live in Mexico, do they still qualify for an ITIN? You would say? The answer is yes. <laughs>